All right. Well, we are just after 2.30 here, so we will go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us for our CAFE Conversations. I'm Elizabeth Vaughn. I'm the Associate Senior Director of Philanthropy for the College. Uh, these are these CAFE Conversations are hosted by the Office of Philanthropy and Alumni and the CAFE Alumni Association. And today we are talking all things extension. So we have Joining me today, we have Dr. Laura Stevenson, who is the Associate Dean for Extension. We have Dr. Jennifer Hunter, who's the Assistant Director of Family and Consumer Sciences. We have Dr. Mark Maines, who's the Assistant Director for 4-H and Youth Development. We have Dr. Craig Wood, who's the Assistant Director for Agricultural mm -hmm. and Natural Resources. And then we have Dr. Allison Davis, who is the Executive Director of the Community and Economic Development, Development Initiative of Kentucky, or CEDIC, as it's more commonly called around here. So I, uh, if you have questions during the, um, as the panelists are speaking, feel free to use your chat feature to ask any of those questions. Um, again, some people have been using the chat feature to share where they're logging in from, which is kind of cool. We can see people from all over the state are joining us today. Um, and so without further ado, Dr. Stevenson, I'm going to turn it over to you to get us started. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, it's wonderful to have uh, conversations with you all today. I want to first share with you that I come from a long line of CAFE alums. Uh, my father is an alum, his two brothers and his two sisters are alums, and I have a cousin that's alum. So I've, I have uh, valued the College of Agriculture and, and now College of uh, the Cafe for many, many years as I was growing up. So COVID-19, that is really one of the things that we'll be talking a lot about today because it's changed the way we do business in so many ways. We have appreciated the continued support of the alumni and volunteers all across the state to help us manage this challenge. As you know, our offices have reopened based on local, state, and national guidelines for limited access, but our programming and assistance to communities has continued with unlimited access. We've worked hard to adapt our outreach to social media, podcasting, county newsletters, county program packets to go, and of course, social distanced uh, programs as allowable. So I wanna give you a few examples, but I don't wanna steal the thunder of our program leaders who'll be sharing you with you more in-depth uh, efforts as they share and talk to you. But we've had uh, our virtual Kentucky 4-H recognition celebration on July 21st, recognize 4-Hers. That uh, alone reached 11,122 people via an online uh, celebration. We have really worked hard to understand the challenging times that everyone and how it has been compounded by difficult financial situations and stress and our ag economics and uh, family consumer science professionals have worked hard to develop materials, resources, podcasts, online uh, opportunities to reach families who are in those um, in those situations and dealing with the financial ramifications of the COVID. Our faculty and agents have teamed together to provide weekly and monthly programs for our Kentucky producers and industry partners using Facebook and YouTube to deliver virtual updates related to beef production, forestry, horticulture, and grains, just to name a few of those uh, ac activities and focus areas. We've had collaborations with partners across the state, including the Kentucky Department of Agriculture. One of those partnerships is the Kentucky Victory Garden effort, which began this summer to uh, encourage and, and uh, support the local interest in agriculture and growing our own food. And there's toolkits that are available all across the state based on this um, effort. So due to the COVID economic impact on the university, we had to take an 11.8% budget reduction in our state funded extension programs in departments and field programs for this budget year. 
So we're taking a very conservative approach to our economic forecast until we know the long range effects of post COVID economic recovery. And to be honest, it's impact on our federal, state and county budgets. The university has instituted a hiring pause and are allowing only critical hiring to be completed. So at this point, we've been able to get permission to move forward with the critical hiring of 12 new administrative positions, agent positions in order to keep a two agent minimum in each county, and county staff assistants and custodians. We hope, excuse me, we hope in the, uh, in the fall to begin to uh, hire again those vacancies, those agent vacancies that we've had for, for so long. Our administrative restructure plans were re-examined due to current and projected fiscal realities, and we've planned to hire eventually 24 area directors who will supervise four to six counties each. However, at this point, we have funds in hand to hire 12 to begin a hybrid approach in which area directors will be assigned two areas with eight to 12 counties each. We will over time move to fill the 24 positions when we feel that we can fiscally support them. The positions were posted today and we plan to begin interviews in September with the goal of hiring all 12 positions by the end of 2020. We've been flexible, adaptable, and relevant through this COVID situation because of the commitment of our people to the mission of Extension in Kentucky. And most importantly, because of the state and local support of our programs. We know that the next few months will continue to be a challenge as we continue to maximize our flexibility to meet the needs of our local communities. But we plan to remain strong and use all the resources we have available to help Kentucky's farm families and communities thrive. So we're looking forward to the conversation today and your questions. And Beth, uh, Elizabeth, I'll turn it back over to you for our next section of the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. We're gonna move into kind of a round table um, discussion here of several kind of items where the different program areas overlap. Dr. Stevenson, do you have maybe kind of a lead in topic that you wanna start with? Well, our first topic is, a fairly general because we want to give each of the program leaders an opportunity to tell us about the extension focus areas that each of you lead and feature some of the programs that you implement. So Jennifer, would you start us off? Certainly. Thank you, Dr. Stevenson, and thank you, Beth, for um, having, having us today. And um, as mentioned earlier, my name is Jennifer Hunter, and I'm the Assistant Director for Family Consumer Sciences Extension. And I think the key word in your, in your prompt was brief, but I do want to share a little bit about our traditional Family Consumer Sciences program and kind of pre-COVID area. And essentially, we operate with two primary goals and objectives within FCS Extension. We want to build strong individuals and thriving families, and we work to do this by providing dynamic, high quality educational program in key areas, including improving physical and mental health. Uh, examples of programming that we might have in those areas is that we have had the opportunity through um, grant dollars to offer amazing military family camping programs over the last several summers that focus on family reintegration um, with our military families. We've recently launched a, um, an app, it's called Fit Blue, that serves as a fitness tracker as well as has um, farmers market locators, summer feeding program locators, um, access to the Kentucky Proud recipe. So just a really neat clearinghouse of information under that area. A second target that we have is improving individual and family development, and this could include parenting, early childhood development, healthy relationships, and aging. I think a really neat program that we launched over the last year is, and we call it PASTA, Parenting a Second Time Around, that focuses on grandparents raising grandchildren and the unique circumstances and special situations that they may encounter and how we can help support those families. A third target area is enhancing life skills and building consumer awareness. So this focuses on the living environment, clothing and textiles, as well as financial education, as well as income and workforce development. Also over the last year, we launched a program called Positive Employability that really focuses on building those 
workplace soft skills. So we know employers can teach the, the hard skills, the technical skills, on the job skills, but we really want to focus on the communication skills, writing, and how to dress for success, properly prepare your resume, proper communication, those type skills. And then um, we also focus in general on supporting and building engaged communities through partnerships and um, programs reaching out to support economic development within those communities. I would also like to close by mentioning our nutrition education program, which is a large part of our family um, consumer sciences extension program that serves all of cooperative extension. Our NEP program encompasses both our SNAP-Ed programming as well as our FNET programming that seeks to bring um, nutrition education to limited resource audiences. Thank you, Jennifer. Dr. Wood, Craig, would you share next? Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here and visit with everybody. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, in, in agriculture, natural resources, and horticulture, uh, our primary goal is to enhance and sustain Kentucky farms and horticulture enterprises. And we do that through a variety of ways. There's a lot of programs and opportunities that are made available uh, with, uh, to the clientele and to producers. And we do that through uh, partnering with a lot of uh, state organizations and our other uh, institution here in the state, Kentucky State University, uh, to help deliver some of those programs. We work closely with uh, KDA and the Governor's Office on Agricultural Policy, particularly during this time of COVID-19, that's really enhanced our partnerships with them in delivering the kinds of information that needs to, uh, to get out. I think one of the things that we discovered in this time is that uh, we have a really good network of getting information out and being able to touch a lot of people uh, at one time. So, uh, being able to partner with those uh, government agencies and others, we were able to deliver a lot of information and keep people going and keep people working and keep them engaged in the kinds of things that they needed to be engaged in. Uh, we also work very closely uh, with the departments in the college on delivering programs and implementing programs and getting that information out there to them. And, and I'm going to talk a little bit later on about some of the programs and some of the in innovative things that uh, the agents came up with and that specialists came up with uh, to provide information to individuals during this time when we had to, to rapidly change our focus and, and work differently, as Dr. Stevenson said. Thank you so much, Craig. Appreciate you. And I'm sorry, up next. Is, uh, is that me? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Stevenson and everyone for the chance to meet with you today. My name is Dr. Mark Maines. I'm the Assistant Director of 4-H Youth Development. Um, in the 4-H program, we work to create experiences or opportunities for youth in Kentucky to engage or create um, positive youth development. And the, via, the way we do that is through our 4-H programs, activities, and events. I always like to say positive youth development is our destination, but the type of vehicle and the path you take to that designation can be tailored toward the individual 4-H um, member. And that's why you see such a diversity of programs and offerings within our 4-H youth development program. In March of this year, our 4-H agents were getting ready for camp. They were finishing out the school year um, in partnership with their local and community schools, and then everything changed. And our 4-H agents, um, have risen to the challenge and worked to create experiences that look a little bit different, but um, that help our youth have um, an opportunity to have a sense of normalcy in these very abnormal times. And we've had a lot of examples of success where 4-H um, programs have done grab and go bags, have done virtual trainings, um, have done virtual um, educational opportunities. We had um, Jessamine County, our 4-H agent there, Kathy Weaver, did Cooking with Kathy, and that received uh, thousands of views on Facebook and shares and engaged a whole new audience, an audience that was looking for programming or ways to entertain and occupy their children's time while they were at home, and turned to our 4-H program. 
So we're very excited about our opportunity to continue our traditional programming in new formats, as well as to open the door to non-traditional programming that continues to engage a diverse audience in Kentucky. And all of that's done through the work of our 4-H agents in their communities and in partnership with their communities and their schools. So um, with that in mind, um, you know, I just wanted to say that to recap, I guess, we're looking at creating those positive youth development experiences. It couldn't happen without the program support of our 4-H agents and our communities. And the reason 4-H has such a diversity in its experiences is because we engage youth in a way that's meaningful to them. We find their spark and work to grow that spark into a passion or an interest that will give them the post-secondary skills and education and opportunities they need to leave our 4-H program and be contributing citizens in their community and in the Commonwealth. Oh, thank you, Mark. Appreciate that. Well, next is Allison Davis. Dr. Davis. Thank you, Dr. Stevenson. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Allison Davis, and I'm a professor of agricultural economics, and I direct SEDIC, which is our Community and Economic Development Initiative of Kentucky, which houses um, community and economic development extension programming, but is actually an integrated research and engagement center that falls under the college's umbrella but focuses on multiple departments, including agricultural economics, um, community leadership development, and landscape architecture. So our, uh, our vision, uh, which I think is pretty succinct and clear, is that we want engaged communities and vibrant economies. And we have five areas of focus that uh, we work daily in, and they are economic development, healthy communities, community leadership development, community design, and arts engagement. And so we don't have agents that have specific responsibilities uh, to community and economic development programming. However, we do work very closely with our extension agents, as well as a broader audience, which includes um, our state economic development cabinet, tourism officials, hospitals, um, elected officials, chambers of commerce, Main Street programs, um, you name it, we, we, we love to work with a bunch of different partners. So we have some kind of traditional extension programming uh, we call first impressions and it's basically a secret shopper program for communities to better understand the outside perspective of what your community looks like to the outsider so that you can prioritize um, investment in uh, different areas to help improve uh, the experience for both the residents and for tourists. We also have a business retention expansion program, which has proven to be particularly important during COVID as all of our businesses have been impacted by this pandemic. And so how can local communities support these existing businesses? Um, we, have, uh, we have a very robust leadership development programming and support for agents, um, either directly through agents with uh, what we call KELD, or we uh, help support local uh, leadership programs, state leadership programs, et cetera. Um, we are one of the only land grant universities in the country. I dare say we probably are the only land grant university in the country that is home to both an arts extension program as well as a community design extension program. We are fortunate to have six individuals, actually nine individuals who support these areas. Some are county-based and some are state-based. Uh, state but it provides a really um, creative, innovative uh, group of solutions for communities um, to, to grow economically um, and to be a place where people wanna live, work, and play. As an example, we recently celebrated our one year anniversary of our Winchester Design Studio. It's a storefront in downtown Winchester in Clark County uh, that is housed by a few landscape architects and architects um, who really are there to support community engagement um, and to kind of creatively design their downtown and to um, inspire youth to work with minority uh, populations um, on all types of tricky issues. Um, so I'm happy to talk more later on about some of the programs that we've been implementing as they relate to COVID, uh, but thank you for this time. Oh, thank you. Well, and those of you on the conversation call, you know we have great pride in Kentucky with the depth and breadth of programming that we have in our extension program. And as you see from these amazing leaders, uh, we, we continue that tradition even as we uh, 
move through this crisis? And that's really our next question. We'd like to hear from all of you as we focused our efforts the last four months on COVID in our communities, what's been the, some of the greatest successes of your program area during this time? Thanks, Laura. I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about the 4-H program. I got excited and jumped ahead in the last question by sharing one of the things, but I think the exciting thing for us in dealing with these very chaotic times has been the ability of our 4-H program agents to sort of pivot in place and start working on different ways of trying to do our programming. For example, um, we have moved to a lot of our offerings online. During the last several months, we've been offering multiple topics that are offered multiple times a day on the Facebook platform and the Instagram platform with the goal of trying to engage our audience where they're at. And when they're stuck at home, a lot of our young people or parents are on social media where they have the opportunity to access that. And we fully understand that not everyone is able to access that. So virtually, we found great success in, um, we have a 4-H agent who does on the ground, and that's where he details his work, um, his study of different native plants across Kentucky. We had Cooking with Kathy that reached thousands of likes and views around the country. We hosted virtual award ceremonies that brought in people who normally wouldn't have access to our programs. And we were really able to reach an audience that um, we traditionally were not able to reach or um, that were a new audience that didn't know about Extension and found us through some of our promotion. But as we talk about virtual things, we've always tried to keep in mind that in some of our counties and some of the communities within counties, there are those individuals or pockets that don't have access to reliable internet. And so we responded by creating grab and go or brown bag programs where agents were going through, especially in the beginning, and sort of pulling together some of those leftover project materials or resources they had in their office, putting it with some of our curriculum, as well as educational material about safety and hygiene under the COVID pandemic that was supplied by our family and consumer science colleagues and the Center for Disease Control and getting those out to the community. Um, we've done our best to record those, but at last check, over 150,000 brown bag or programs to go were distributed to families across the Commonwealth. And many of our 4-H agents said that they were seeing people who never had access or never accessed extension before coming to find those hands-on resources that they could use to um, engage their child in something during the day or supplement their virtual learning or non-traditional instruction or even just occupy some time so the parents or guardians could find a few moments of peace during these hectic times. So through both virtual and non-virtual means, we've worked to create programs that really reach out to the community and we're excited by the success we've had in re-engaging our traditional audiences and bringing many, many new audience members to the table to learn about extension and what we can offer. Thanks, Mark. Um, I think I'll go next. It's always hard to follow Mark. He's got so much enthusiasm and does such great work. Um, but I'm going to top him today. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so this has been uh, certainly a trying time for so many of our communities, rural and urban, large and small. Um, and one of the things um, largely due to the partners we have in our communities um, and the importance of our community foundations, we were able to mobilize um, some significant dollars out the door to support our small businesses. Um, so, uh, and we were able to do it fast. Uh, much faster than the SBA, much faster than um, different types of larger foundations. So over the course of about four months or so, we got um, about $750,000 out the door um, to support small businesses across 29 different counties. Um, it was an application process. We were supporting locally owned businesses, largely that were uh, restaurants, accommodations, those that were hit hardest when there was a shutdown. Um, and many businesses we heard from said that this was really the money that made or, break, made or broke them, um, that it allowed them to pay rent, allowed them to keep their employees on staff. Um, and so for that, we were 
super appreciative to be able to um, work with our partners to be able to identify sources of funds, um, including our own college funds to support um, those efforts. In addition, because we have such a robust community design program, um, we were able to get our folks out into the communities to help restaurants, um, particularly, figure out how they can get individuals to order, pick up, and eat food. And it sounds silly, um, but it's hard. And a lot of uh, our state business, our, our restaurants are on state roads, and so there's a lot of policy and, and red tape around that. Um, and one of the pictures, if you were on early, which doesn't look like any of the other pictures, was a picture of what we call our PEZ, which is our pedestrian expansion zones, which is a way to safely have folks be able to eat outside and, and have pedestrians be able to walk um, safely. And, and even we saw a pretty big uptick in pedestrian um, accidents this year as a result of COVID. And so we thought this was a very timely um, piece. Um, in addition, you know, while COVID was going on, we also were facing a significant uh, national pressure and we are grappling with racial inequity and injustice. And so we have been conducting trainings, virtual trainings um, with a bunch of different audiences to address health inequities um, by providing tools to ensure that all people have an opportunity to live their healthiest lives um, and to try to identify, address, and, uh, and change those systemic um, barriers to health equity. Um, recently, we also worked with the city of Lexington and its um, new commission for racial justice and equality to consider the current obstacles for employment uh, for minority populations, as well as economic development opportunities um, that would capitalize on Lexington's amazing rural uh, and ag landscape. Finally, because we are um, an integrated research and engagement center, we tried to provide very timely research um, that were largely county-based that highlighted the importance of broadband, um, not just for uh, students to be able to access their coursework, but to be able to remote work, um, to be able to access telehealth um, when all of our hospitals um, basically uh, shut down except for emergency purposes. Um, we looked at the uh, distribution of our the famous PPP loans to see where they were going, if it seemed equitable, um, to just bring the conversation to light. Um, and we really looked at what does this COVID mean for our small businesses and for our entrepreneurs, and we were really trying to track um, the, the economic impact and, and to be able to prepare um, for their recovery post the pandemic. So I'll uh, jump in and go ahead and uh, go now and follow Allison. Uh, and I think one of the successes, uh, the greatest successes that we've had in the a and horticulture agent was a area is the nimbleness and the adaptability of our agents. When uh, things started happening and we had to change the way we did things, they were really remarkable in the way in which they adapted and the, and the nimbleness of how they worked. Uh, one of the things that came up early on uh, in once we were making that transition is that a lot of the producers were coming to them and saying, you know, how are we going to handle these cost share programs that we uh, so vitally need and we participate in? You know, how am I going to get my training so that I can complete my application and meet that requirement? And so the agents were asking uh, specialists how that was going to work. Uh, the governor's office on agriculture policy was involved on how can we handle this and how can we get that training to those individuals so that they can continue to operate uh, their businesses and their enterprises and, and get the things they need through that cost share money, uh, cost share funds. So what we did is we started working with a lot of those uh, partners and how we could create an environment where they could get their training, that it would be easier for for those individuals to access it. And then we would be able to track and provide the reporting mechanism back to the agents and to those governing committees in the counties uh, that those individuals, individuals had actually had that training uh, similar to what they would do if, they, if the agents delivered that training in kind of a face-to-face -face way. So we took a lot of those programs like that and we shifted them to an interactive learning environment in which those individuals could come in uh, create a user account and then per and participate in and work through the particular module that they needed 
to qualify and complete their application for some of the cost share funds. A lot of those were videos that we had to uh, import in and put in that environment so that those individuals can watch them. And what we found as it got, as we started working through that is that was uh, the clientele adapted to that very readily and they were able to use that environment. They were able to uh, complete their trainings, complete their applications and get those turned in to uh, the county committees that uh, govern that uh, in order for them to qualify for the cost share funds. We also had to send those reports to the agents because the agents were the ones that kind of certified and made sure that the, the subject matter content was there. So we would have to create reports uh, that would be sent to them. Roughly, we've had about a thousand people go through those programs so far so that they can continue uh, to get their funds. Uh, that's still going on. In fact, I had an email today about uh, uh, continuing to use that and how those uh, producers from a particular county could get it, could access and get into that uh, particular training. We had the uh, issue with the beef quality assurance, the same thing. They needed to have certifications in order to qualify for certain things. So we did the same thing with them. I think you can see that uh, the agents were very adaptable in what they did. Uh, the horticulture agents developed a really successful program that's going on. They called it Horticulture Wednesday. It's a webinar where they talk about different kinds of things related to horticulture. The presentations last you know, roughly about 20, 25 minutes. And then there's this robust question and answer session that goes on after that. They've incorporated using the polling functions uh, in the web conferencing technology so that they have interaction taking place that way as well as a very vibrant, as I said, question and answer session going on. Uh, the, I don't know if you're aware, but during the early part of COVID-19, uh, the cattle market kind of took a nosedive. Uh, Dr. Kenny Burdine stepped up and started giving weekly updates to agents so that they could be informed and know what's going on and be able to talk to their cattle producers out in the state about what's happening in the cattle market. He would talk about his projections and what he think was gonna happen in the coming week. Early on, he did those weekly. Then he turned them into little videos that he put on Facebook. Uh, so they had video updates going. And as the market kind of came back and began to stabilize, now he's gone more to a monthly uh, cattle market update that he provides. Also, we had uh, the corn and soybean, Chad Lee, and uh, them stepped up and started doing some updates on what's going on with corn and soybean and the production of that, uh, and really stayed ahead of uh, the production that was going on in the state and tried to make uh, everybody be reassured that things were going to be all right as we move forward. There's a lot of different things that went on. I know that we've had some virtual field days that have taken place that were, that have been very successful, that they tried to do those just like they would in face-to-face. -face. So they took those participants out to the field using videos and had interaction with them that way and, and while they were watching it online. So there's been a lot of innovation take place in the area of agriculture, natural resources, and horticulture to deliver that programming that we typically would have done in a face-to-face -face kind of way, but we did it differently. And that's, that's just solely because of the way in which the agents were adaptable and how nimble they were in being able to change and still deliver the same services to their clientele uh, that they serve in the county. Yeah, and I'll wrap us up on this question. And as I was listening to Mark and Craig and Allison, I think I heard this common theme that I heard Mark say pivot in place and I heard Allison say rapid response and Craig say adaptability. And I would use um, those three terms to also describe our family consumer science and extension programming. I cannot say enough about how impressed I have been with the ability of our agents and our specialists and our associates to literally turn on a dime and begin offering um, our programming through virtual formats. And I, it, it was hard to choose just a few to highlight during this time today, but I did try to, to narrow it down that um, we have, since the beginning of kind of um, the transition, offered what we have called a Healthy at Home webinar series. So I believe this week we offered webinar number 36, which is amazing that we've been going that long. On average, those webinars are reaching 2,000 individuals per topic, which we feel is an amazing outreach. Mark talked about reaching clientele beyond our traditional clientele. We have certainly seen that. 
um, through our Healthy at Home webinar series and um, expanded far beyond the borders of the state of Kentucky as well. So it has been neat to reach out and program in different ways and on new and different topics. Also through this time, we have um, been able to um, engage with our specialists and associates to provide relevant, timely information through social media. Our social media engagement has skyrocketed. Um, for this post specific to COVID-19 type programming or information, um, we're reaching up close to 1.5 million user engagements over the last few months. So we definitely feel as if we have found ways to continue to engage clientele during this time. To highlight a few of, of our programs that um, over um, mid-June through July, we offered a series called uh, a Sizzling Summer that we really tried to um, focus on um, activities that families could do together during the summer, information that would be engaging to families during the summer, and encouraging folks to, to be out and be healthy and eating nutritiously um, while also being mindful of all that is associated with COVID. Um, over the last several months, we have hosted both a virtual 5K as well as a virtual 5K slash 10K, two different events that have had over 700 registrants combined. Again, encouraging physical activity during this time. As we all said on Zoom this afternoon, we know that everyone is Zoom fatigue. There's sometimes at the end of the day, I'll look down at my fitness tracker and I may have 1200 steps for the day. So we really want to encourage people to be out and to, and to move. And so we have worked hard to do that um, through physical activity. I would also like to acknowledge the work of our Family Consumer Science Agents as well as our Kentucky Extension Homemaker Association we received a direct request from the University of Kentucky Children's Hospital um, for cloth face coverings to be able to supply those to not only the medical professionals, but also the children as well as their parents that um, for some reason may be at the children's hospital. The initial request was for 200 um, cloth face coverings and we delivered um, over 3,400 which I think was an amazing outreach, greatly appreciated by the Children's Hospital. And I think just a true testament to our extension across the state and our ability to be able to mobilize and to meet a need. Our nutrition education program throughout this time has truly been recognized as a national model. We were very fortunate that our NEP program had been pilot testing virtual programming the last several years. And so when the time came, they were ready to ramp up immediately to be able to continue to reach out to our low income audiences across the state with nutrition education programming. But not only that, they were able to help other implementing agencies across the country also transition from the traditional face-to-face -face model to the online virtual programming model. Um, Dr. Stevenson mentioned at, at the very beginning about the Victory Garden Program um, partnership with the Kentucky Department of Agriculture. The nutrition education program was integral in um, helping to launch the Victory Garden campaign. And really and truly that was supporting that as people have been home this summer, we know that, um, that, that backyard gardening has, been, has had quite the uptick and just really supporting folks that it may be their first time to um, raise their own, own veggies at home, or maybe it's something that they haven't done in, in a while, but giving those, them those materials and resources and support that they need. And the final program that I'll mention, and again, Dr. Stevenson gave a slight nod to this at the beginning, is the Crossing Through This Program, that um, as, as Dr. Wood just mentioned, that our farm economy has struggled during this time, will most likely continue to, to struggle in the upcoming months and are crossing through this program as a partnership with the Department of Agriculture Economics as well as Ag Program and Family Consumer Sciences to help both farm and family deal with the financial struggles that they're currently experiencing or maybe moving into over the upcoming months. But it has been an ongoing webinar series bringing in professionals um, not only within the state of Kentucky but also external to Kentucky that are um, true experts in this field to provide support. Oh, thank all of you. You know, as we look at the various programs that you highlighted, the, the key in all that is the fact that 
we are an organization that works hand in hand together from state to local efforts. And this whole uh, past four months have shown how quick we can react. And it's because of your leadership. So thank you all. The, the next question that we have, it, it jumps before COVID because uh, we were in the process of spending an extensive amount of time and effort to conduct individual county needs assessments to help us understand local needs and the statewide programmatic needs. So in looking at this data, you as leaders coordinate responses on major issues. And one of those issues that emerged was the reality of substance abuse and mental health issues in the state. Could you talk about the integrated approach and how this has worked across the state to engage leaders and agents in this issue? I'm happy to um, start the conversation since we helped pioneer this massive effort where we had 34,000 survey responses and 500 focus groups and interviews across the state. And um, as a result, there were three priorities that as a group of program leaders, we chose to, to really tackle in the first year, um, which are still very relevant um, during the COVID crisis. And uh, economic development, community vitality and leadership was one, and then substance use and mental health was um, our last one. And I think um, our work across the program areas um, and the integration across the program areas has, has really been important um, because this problem is wicked and there is not one single person, not one single entity, not one single healthcare system that will be able to address this alone. Um, so we, we decided to first look inward to be able to identify the types of extension programs, resources, expertise that we had. Um, and we provided a webinar for our agents that really said, we, this is how we define the problem. Um, we were very clear that we, our efforts are around recovery and they're around prevention. Uh, we leave treatment up to our medical professionals um, and we just try to figure out how we can fit in. So there are several examples um, where uh, the program areas work closely together to comprehensively address um, these prevention and recovery efforts. So I'll, I'll talk about just a few and then probably steal some of Jennifer's thunder, but I've, I've hopefully have left her some thunder to, to do. Um, so we've been working closely with FCS and 4-H on, on a project where aesthetics role is to infuse arts and creativity, kind of similar to arts therapy, um, into the recovery process. So our arts extension program in partnership with the College of Fine Arts um, has created an art toolkit which is very similar to um, like a subscription box, which for me is just super cool. Um, and th so through agents, um, individuals either in recovery or their family members or caregivers um, would be able to have access to these toolboxes, these toolkits that have art supplies and walk them through the process of recovery, um, through creativity, through drawing, through writing. And so they have a journal that they'll be using um, and each, they'll, every other week, they'll be able to access new art supplies to again, be able to find a way to, to go through this process, um, either themselves or their family. So we're really excited about that. That will be emerging um, soon. And again, we did have to pivot because of COVID and now have gone to a subscription box. These were going to be in-person um, programs. In addition, we work really closely with our hospitals across the state. We help um, about 35 hospitals do their community health needs assessments. Um, and we've been doing this for about six years now. And one thing that has been very clear is this is their top priority, um, substance use, disorder is typically a secondary diagnosis. Individuals are in the emergency room um, and they are diagnosed with an overdose, but they are treated for that overdose and not necessarily treated for um, the root cause, which is a substance use or mental health issue. And so hospitals in partnership with uh, lots of different local partners are trying to come up with a systems-based approach um, for prevention, uh, for treatment, and for recovery. And so we work really closely with them as they go through that planning process. Um, so I think uh, I'll let Jennifer, when it becomes her time, talk more about some of the other programs that we are, we are doing together around this area. Uh, thank you, Allison. And I will say that, that substance use and mental health is an area that I am so proud of the Kentucky Cooperative Extension Service in terms of building programming around that when we think about the, the grassroots 
effort of coming from the needs assessment up from the counties that um, recognizing the need for programming in this area and then our ability to be able to, to meet that need is something that I'm very excited about. I will say um, over the last year, we have been fortunate enough to add a new extension faculty member in the area of substance use prevention and recovery, Dr. Alex Ellswick. And I, I believe Dr. Ellswick is one of the first in the nation. So again, the opportunity to um, lead land grant institutions um, in the substance use prevention and recovery through extension efforts. And uh, through our partnership with SEDEC uh, as well as 4-H, we have been able to roll out several programs over the last year. Um, one of which that just came to fruition this week is a curriculum called Recovering Your Finances which um, developed holistically from the Kentucky Cooperative Extension Service is a financial curriculum specifically targeted to those individuals in recovery. That um, we know research tells us that an individual is more likely to sustain recovery if we can enhance and build what is known as their recovery assets, which many of us would call those traditional life skills. And financial life skills is truly one of those. The Recovering Your Finance curriculum um, directly um, addresses financial concerns of individuals that are that are in recovery. And we offered our first training this week and we'll be um, continuing to train our agents through the fall. Additionally, um, we have rolled out a program called Addiction 101, which is to help help communities, help individuals just like us understand addiction. There is um, so much misinformation about um, addiction and so much misunderstanding that um, Dr. Ellswick has been able to, to help us understand more about addiction in our communities and how it is that local communities could work together in the areas of prevention and recovery. We're also very excited to be rolling out the Botvin Life Skills Program, which is a prevention program. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal a term from Dr. Baines. Um, it focuses on building positive youth assets and that um, we are in the process of rolling that out in four counties across the state. However, um, we, we've recently received additional grant funding that will allow us to expand that program. In the area of mental health, we have worked to train 30 individuals within our system um, as specialists as well as agents in the mental health first aid program targeting both youth and adults which again allows to have community conversations and individuals in local communities to be more prepared and have more awareness and knowledge in the uh, um, realm of mental health. Thanks, Jennifer. And within the 4-H program, we believe um, we see our youth as existing within three realms, the realm of school or academics, family or personal lives, and then community. And it's our goal that our young people be supported in all of those areas, but to help our 4-H professionals support young people, we have undertaken an effort along with the other program areas in ensuring that all the 4-H agents and 4-H assistants over the next couple years will be trained in the mental health first aid curriculum for youth so that they can um, have a knowledgeable or trained eye at looking for when young people are under pressures that might lead to mental health challenges or mental health concerns so that they can then refer them appropriately and support them with the goal that everyone in a young person's life should be looking out for them and helping them um, sustain and build the resiliency skills they need to have to be um, contributing adults. With that said, again, with our audience, we don't see as much um, substance abuse initially, but what we know is that the more resiliency skills a person can have, or the more assets they can have, the better they will be able to resist um, substance use pressures or making poor decisions. And so within the 4-H program, we're focusing on using our traditional programs, activities, and events, but doing it in a very intentional way that says we are working with this young person to create so many positives that when they inevitably come across those negatives, they're better prepared and more resilient and can get past that situation in a way that will sustain them into the future. And so we're excited to be training our workforce on mental health first aid and continuing to work with them to provide programs that build those important and vital developmental assets. Thanks, Mark. I'll wrap this uh, question up uh, by sharing a little bit about what we're doing 
uh, with A&R. And uh, Dr. Hunter mentioned a little bit of it earlier with the Crossing Through This, which is a program that uh, A&R partnered with, with Family Consumer Science and uh, Ag Economics uh, to help uh, expose uh, producers and all to uh, available resources that they can have to help uh, manage their uh, farm uh, enterprise as they uh, work through 2020. Uh, one of the things early on we wanted to do is we wanted to make access to information very uh, easy uh, and less stressful to the producers uh, because we didn't want to add to their stress. We wanted to help mitigate it. So we tried to do things that would allow them to access information when it was convenient for them to, to access it. Uh, so if it was early in the morning or if it was late at night, once they were done working, we wanted them to be able to have uh, the ability to access inf that information uh, and be able to use it readily and make it easy for them. Uh, one of the things we tried to do as well is put them in touch with uh, other partner uh, agencies that we worked with uh, in A&R, uh, state and federal, uh, so that uh, if they needed some information on loan programs, uh, potential funding opportunities, or if I need to restructure, uh, or if they need to restructure their debt, uh, that they would have resources available in which to do that and sources in which they can go uh, look for those kinds of information to kind of decrease their stress level, decrease the mental uh, stress that they may be having uh, so that uh, they wouldn't go down the road uh, potentially to uh, substance ab uh, abuse in those areas. There were some things we were doing prior to that that were related to that, uh, that uh, we haven't been able to figure out a way to do those virtually. Uh, but once we have the opportunity to get back to those, we'll be doing some of those things again. Uh, but the biggest thing we've done is try to put them through the agents and the specialists, uh, those producers in contact uh, with those funding opportunities and with those loan uh, particular opportunities uh, to help them mitigate any kind of financial situation they might be encouraging, incurring uh, in 2020. Thank you all for all of those uh, wonderful overviews of all the different programs. I'm always amazed by how many different areas uh, extension impacts across you know, individuals across our state. And as you guys have said, one big advantage, I guess, maybe to COVID and going online with a lot of programs, we're now expanding that reach beyond the state. So we have a few audience questions that were submitted in advance. I'm gonna jump into those. This first one, really probably Dr. Maines is best suited for you. Uh, we had a participant ask, is there a creative writing component in 4-H, teaching youth to communicate effectively um, and uh, to be extremely articulate is important. Um, and so they were wondering if that's something that 4-H focuses on. Right, thank you very much, Beth. Yes, um, we have our 4-H communications program, which traditionally included illustrated talks or demonstrations and then the more traditional speech format where they gave a for formal presentation. A couple years ago, um, we added writing categories into that and we're offering a number of opportunities for youth to engage the written word in a way that helps them um, learn the ability to communicate through that avenue. And so with our written communications program, which is where you submit them, there's poetry, essays, um, Ad advertisements or PSAs where they can do public service announcements. There's a couple different um, opportunities for that. But we think one of the best things that young people take away from 4-H is the ability to communicate, whether that's verbally or in writing. We're there to help you become a more accomplished communicator. As a former 4-H'er myself, I remember there being writing components to everything I did. So it's good to hear that we're still doing that. And it might have been my least favorite part of it, but it was an important part. So, um, one of, and this is kind of maybe a bigger, broader question a few of you may want to touch on. Uh, you know, during the pandemic, we've seen stresses on the existing supply chain, which has resulted in both shortages in food supplies and higher prices um, in a lot of our grocery stores and markets. So, what do you all see as some of the things we can do? in Kentucky to ensure the availability and affordability of nutritious food for people across the Commonwealth. Uh, 
think I'll, we're, well, we're, sorry, Jennifer, real quick, we didn't practice who's going to go first <laughs> on this. I think from the 4-H youth development side of things, we can really help in a couple ways. Taking the high quality information provided by agriculture and natural resources and family consumer sciences and making sure that our clientele or their family have access to that. Additionally, we have the opportunity to train a whole new generation of backyard gardeners through our 4-H horticulture programs. Additionally, as food becomes more expensive, it creates a greater burden on our support systems that are in place to help those that are food insecure or lack the meals they need. And another way that we're doing that is through our 4-H Donate a Deer program, where we engage our youth shooting sports participants to um, take one or two of the deer they harvest during the hunting season and donate that for at-cost processing at an, um, one of the approved processors. That protein is then turned around and given to food banks to help bolster the protein that's always in short supply at our food banks. So that's how 4-H is kind of addressing that. I would just add that um, food access is one of the areas that is a top priority for us in terms of programming. Um, that's definitely highlighted through our nutrition education program. Uh, if that's working with summer feeding programs or food pantries, food banks, uh, working um, in conjunction with KDA to, to support food access. That is also a focus of our um, of our faculty and extension specialists in the Department of Dietetics and Human Nutrition, just ensuring that individuals know where they can access, especially those that are food insecure. Um, I would also say that at the beginning, just um, as we were experiencing these shortages and people had kind of this sense of panic, that our specialists worked specifically to program about pantry staples and um, many folks were cooking the much more than what they had in the past. So some of that back to basics education about how to use what you have and how to prepare it at home. Yeah, and I'll just uh, add one, a couple of things based on a uh, comment Mark made about uh, backyard gardeners. I think that's a tremendous opportunity we have. I think we're seeing a lot of individuals uh, that are growing gardens this year uh, that they've contacted the horticulture agents in their county on how to do that uh, successfully. Uh, I think another area where we can secure and make sure we have some food supply for Kentuckians and all are the uh, community supported agriculture. Uh, some of the community gardens and all that uh, that are community supported that uh, people share in the produce that's produced there. I think those are, that's an area in which we can uh, continue to work in and continue to improve in uh, to make sure we have a healthy food supply. I'll just end with one thing about there's a very strong relationship um, in the administration now between economic development and agriculture. Um, and so the supply chain where we've really explored all pieces of the supply chain processing manufacturing, which was so impacted when there was COVID, but, you know, originally from imports and then with COVID breaking out in a lot of our rural processors, where we've now started working with our local economic developers so that they understand that they need a plan B and, and then a plan C so that they are able to identify other suppliers. Uh, they're able to know who their local farmers are, that their local farmers are organized and they're in direct communication with all of the markets. Um, that became very apparent. And unfortunately, we were not super prepared for that, but we will be prepared for next time. And our faculty have worked across the board on many of these issues with researchers. And we've had multi-state partnerships with extension faculty and researchers, especially in regard to the meat processing uh, or lack of meat processing and working with the governor's office on ag policy to promote and their new program that relates to meat processing is going to be an important uh, role in the future. Great, thank you all. We have an aspiring extension agent on the call and has asked, you know, in light of the hiring freezes, um, what would any of you all recommend to somebody who is would like to get into extension, but maybe it's a year or two down the road? Is there anything they could focus on or skills they could improve upon that you all think are important for our agents to have? I'll start. We get this question all the time because a lot of our 4-H members are interested in giving back to a program that was so influential to them. And what I really suggest is be as well-rounded as possible. So 
pro get yourself the education and the majors or minors that you need to show a skill of expertise in ag, FCS, and or 4-H youth development. There are degree requirements for agriculture and family consumer sciences. And ultimately, we look for experience within positive youth development. And that experience doesn't always come from education degrees because we deal with education in a non-formal environment. So I think cross-training is really good. And I think the other thing that people need to remember is at the end of the day, beyond the component of education, we're really helping to work with a large um, multi-layer nonprofit or not-for-profit organization. So any development they can do in terms of um, community and leadership development classes creates a very well-rounded person who can bring a lot of skills to the table. And that ultimately is what makes a really good extension agent. I would just add, I agree with everything Mark said there. I would just add, you know, uh, that it would be good if they volunteered, got involved some in the county to see what's going on, to see how it works, uh, develop those communication skills, uh, develop the writing ability and all and everything else that Mark added, but just volunteer uh, so that you can be involved and see what's going on in the county that they're in. And I will also say I've hired some of my best staff who have um, been an extension intern um, and they have an opportunity to see what they like and what they don't. Um, and I've ha had someone who was started at 4-H and, and is now a full-time staff and, and just has just hit the ground running. So that's a great opportunity uh, that I would encourage. Fantastic. And I think this will probably be our last question as we're wrapping up on time here. For people, you know, lots of people around the uh, counties and around the state really obviously care deeply about extension. And, you know, I think, Mark, you've mentioned kind of using the phrase of how it impacts people, you know, deeply. And I think there's a lot of us out there that would say that about extension. So for those folks, what would you guys say, how could they help during this challenge, during this time? Is there anything they can do to contribute to extension in some way? Yeah, so um, I often tell folks that I'm, I'm extension raised, that I, I came into extension in the fourth grade through the speech and demonstration contest, and I have been part of the Kentucky Cooperative Extension Service ever since. But um, I, I, I truly feel like that what, what we need is community support, um, it, volunteers within, within programming. When we ask for the needs assessment, it's a wonderful example of give us your input because really and truly we are a grassroots organization that is here to serve the people of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And to serve the people of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, we need to know what they need. And in Dr. Stevenson and Dr. Wood and Dr. Maines and Dr. Davis, we can, we can sit around a table and we can theorize and um, talk about what we think the people need, but that's not the same as people giving us their feedback. So when we ask for those feedback and provide those feedback opportunities, it truly is valuable for folks to, to contribute to that. But certainly volunteering, whether it's through 4-H programs or Master Clothing Volunteers, the Kentucky Extension Homemakers Association, the Master Gardeners, but truly being engaged with your um, local cooperative extension service helps support the, support the extension service, the university, as well as your local community. I guess oh, I would say that bring a friend, bring someone who doesn't know extension, um, invite them in, um, be, uh, be ready for a little bit of, of risk. Let's try something new um, so that we are able to reach all those audiences that um, can be served by extension and benefited from extension. Um, I just love when I go to a place and I see someone who's new, who's young, who's of a different color, who's never heard of extension before and is wowed by what they learn. Um, and so that's my advice. I would just, I agree with everything that's been said. I would just add that uh, at this time, uh, if you, to have a little bit of understanding that the, you know, the agents are working hard. Uh, they've been uh, working differently. Uh, they have a lot of stresses as well. 
you know, they have to manage uh, the job that they're doing as well as home life, as well as childcare uh, during this time. So, uh, you know, a little bit of understanding uh, could go a long way uh, as people come into the extension office and, and uh, want to work with us and help us out. And I think for me, I think the biggest thing that we're looking for um, is an advocate. And someone can advocate with their time, their talent, um, their pocketbook in some cases, but be the person who is using your voice and your resources to talk about extension by sharing it with new audiences, by reinforcing within um, the political realm or the community realm about how vital extension is to our Commonwealth. One thing that I love about um, the, the, our response to the COVID out, uh, pandemic was how quickly Extension was able to mobilize and bring together a diverse set of communities through one cohesive program where we were able to get information out to help our communities and to get information from our communities back to those people that make decisions. Not a lot of agencies can do that. And so extension is there as long as we have our citizens to advocate for us through a variety of ways. And I think a, a final comment is that we all want COVID to be over, but we honestly don't know when it's going to be over. And this has been a daily change of operations for us. Something that we had never ever dreamed of uh, because we're making decisions and then have to pull back and make other decisions and move forward. So as, as leaders and supporters, just uh, again, I reiterate what uh, Dr. Wood said, uh, understand when things change on a daily basis, but also, look forward with us and help us learn the lessons and, 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 and continue doing programs based on the lessons we've learned through this COVID crisis. Because there have been opportunities that we've never had before. And there's also gaps and challenges that we're gonna overcome. But it may be after COVID, but we've learned the lessons and need to move forward to do, to continue in the directions we're going in many ways. So continue to give us feedback. They gave you all good, um, good suggestions. Thank you, Elizabeth, for this opportunity. Yes, thank all of you for joining us today and thank you to our attendees for joining us as well. I think, I know I personally learned a lot, so I'm glad we could do this and share a little bit more about the uh, reach of extension across the state. We are taking off the month of September from our cafe conversations. So for those of you uh, that have joined us on quite a few of them, we'll be back in October and um, watch your emails for more information about that. In the meantime, I do invite you to check out the uh, college's website and all of our social media. You can see all of the cool programs that were talked about here today, plus so many more across the college, across Extension that we weren't able to touch on. Uh, and you can stay up to date on everything we're doing uh, through this pandemic and then just continuing our everyday research and welcoming students back to campus and all kinds of great things happening uh, in spite of COVID. We're still moving forward. So uh, thank you all again, and I hope everybody has a good afternoon. Thank you.